Imagine, Victoria Safford wrote, how many breaths you would need to take. Imagine how many doors you'd have to knock on, how many phone calls you'd have to make, how many letters, how many lunches and coffees, how many awkward moments with your children and your parents with strangers, that cashier with whom or to whom you spoke so sharply. Awkward is irrelevant. The task is not about comfort, it is about truth, about wholeness, about holiness, restoration. Imagine this. It's always hard to imagine the work of restoration, of what at this time of the year between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in the Jewish tradition is the season for the work of atonement or of seeking to be at one again with the world, with all other people in it, with yourself, really. We can't underestimate the challenge and the gift of this kind of restorative work, though. One notion of sin, popular among those seeking to redefine the word in more humanist terms, but also theists of the modern universalist variety who write off any notion of, of hell as some place that awaits any of us in an afterlife. One notion of sin is is for those who see the world more about, and life and religion, more about the here and the now and undergirded by a expansive power of love, is the notion of sin as the state right now, always, of living outside of right relationship. That can mean outside of right relationship with the best part of ourselves, the sweetest part, that truest part we know, out of right relationship with that same part in other people and in the world at large as we move through it. When people say in moments of despair at the conditions of the world that the sinners the greedy, the cheaters, the beaters, the liars, the ones who tear down what is good and beautiful. When people say that those folks too often seem to get away with their perfidy, I completely understand the moral affront of it. I feel it too some days. I feel, I <laughs> will admit, Sometimes the desire for some good old-fashioned cosmic smackdown and otherworldly retribution for sins. And once that unworthy fantasy passes, I am reminded that, well, of what I actually believe with others in our religious world, that sin is this, is actually this alienation from self and others. I feel these days, especially when an ambulance passes, we have to take a moment to wish them well. That it's this alienation from self and others. And the hell that we might talk about is very present always and inescapably in the everyday reality of being a person who walks through the world leaving so much carnage behind them. To be such a person, after all, my loves, if you just think about it, is to walk the earth, think about it, with so little real love coming out of you or reflected back at you, no earned trust anywhere you go, no spontaneous tenderness or real friendships, does that sound like you got away with anything? By contrast, 
there are people in this congregation alone that I know, and you do too, who, as hard as life gets, are so determined to be kind and honest and courageous that you fall in love with them, that you smile spontaneously when they enter the room, that you would do anything for them, even when you hardly know them. You might say they carry heaven with them. You might say that heaven and hell are very much at hand all the time, my friends. It just depends on how you live your life, which one you find yourself in. And if I'm right on all this, then life itself is the fastest game of karma in town. And atonement is all the more important as we move through this world to make it what we hope for it in our lives. I imagine that right now it's hard to think of this world attending to atonement of because it's not much, but we should be. So what does atonement ask of us? Let's do a big, quick, deep dive. Atonement first asks that we see that it's not often easy. It is awkward and worse to have hurt someone, right, by mistake, because maybe we were so caught up in our own world or paid so little attention to other people's worlds that we didn't see that we could be doing harm, that feels awful. And then to have hurt someone because we were being passive aggressive, oof, that's even harder. And to admit that we were being maybe aggressively aggressive in some circumstances, mean-spirited and small-hearted, those are the admissions I think that we can hold inside for a long time denying or avoiding. But none of it feels good to say, right? And yet the first step in atonement is admitting that we are capable of betraying the best in ourselves the best of our dreams for our relationships with others. As Sam said, we will break our vows a thousand times. And the first step is this confession. I was listening to an interview this last week with Ibram Kendi. He was being interviewed by Brene Brown about his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Some of us read the book together in the Minister's Book Club, and others I know have read it on your own. I had forgotten or not thought about the fact that he begins the book in many ways with a confession of his own mistakes. Maybe you remember how vulnerable and personally revelatory he is in the first chapters. In them, Kendi writes about the ways he bought into racist ideas and how he conspired with them in his own life choices. He said those first chapters took him a year to write, that there was a ton of shame about naming what he had thought and felt about himself and black people and white folks. In fact, it wasn't until he got diagnosed with colon cancer and wondered if he would ever see the book published that he said he felt free to just write all of it because getting it out into the world was more important than any of the conflict and shame he felt about what he needed to say in it. What I took away when I read that book wasn't at all Kendi's confession. It was the way he was asking me and other Americans, white folks and others, to take responsibility for actively dismantling racism and all that that might entail he was, you might say, inviting us to enter back into right relations with each other, with him, with 
other black folk, with our nation's ideals too, with all of who we were. And we would have some atoning to do, especially we white folks. But I hadn't caught that he began the book with his own atonement, and I certainly didn't know how hard that was for him. Of course, Ibram Kendi wasn't naming the hard and shameful things that he had done and not done just to make pain for himself or because he had nothing better to do. He did it with a goal in mind of more healing, of more wholeness, of restoration. He did it imagining what might be and having that draw him into and forward through his work. He said in the interview, the heartbeat historically of racism has been denial, has been to deny that one's ideas are racist, that one's policies are racist, and certainly that oneself and one's nation is racist. By contrast, the heart of anti-racism is confession, Admission is acknowledgement, is the willingness to be vulnerable, is the willingness to diagnose ourselves and our country and our ideals and our policies. Like with anything else, the first step is acknowledging the problem. We can't even begin to change ourselves, he said of acting in an anti-racist fashion if we're not even willing to admit the times in which we were being racist. What he is saying is true about our anti-racist work and it is true about any work of healing and wholeness making and restoration isn't it? The first step being moving from some kind of denial with a confession that sometimes talks about what went wrong, where we went awry, some place we acknowledge that we betrayed someone or some principle that was sacred and sweet to us and that isn't okay to have left behind injured. Such vulnerability in that first step, how hard. And then, then comes what Judaism calls teshuvah, the turning, the next step in the turning, really. The work of changing our ways, of making real amends, the literal restoration of relationship to the best and the sweetest and the dearest parts of ourselves and the best and the sweetest and the dearest ways we can connect to one another and to the world. The making, you might say, of heaven and not hell here on earth. So here in church and in our lives, we people of faith, faith not in dogma, not in any notion of what the ground of all being or the face and scope of a God might be, but faith in things like goodness and love and mercy and justice and honesty. We, we're called to learn and practice atonement. We have to, right? Because the world needs people who can model what it means to get back into right relations, not just continue to leave carnage behind and pretend that that's normal. And we would be blessed to always be such a people, wouldn't we? What will that mean? What does it mean? Every time we do it, you know, it means, as Robin D'Angelo says, letting go of some notion of ourselves as good, some fossilized good that can fend off any criticism or implications that we might have done wrong, and just be instead people seeking to be in right relationship. 
It means that we always have to put our goals, our biggest, most beautiful goals ahead of our egos. Catch ourselves when we dig in our heels in defensiveness and turn to wonder, as Parker Palmer says, to wonder in a moment if we've shut our ears just when something new might break open our world, tear down walls that we've tended to for far too long and for no good reason at all. Being a people skilled in atonement means that we will let go of believing that intent is what matters and realize how the way that what we do impacts someone is actually what matters and learn to the power of an apology, sincere and caring, to lessen the sting of even the inadvertent hurt. We will learn also the accountability that comes with the turning. The commitment to do and be different, to allow ourselves to be changed. And all of this, my friends, toward the goal of restoring us each and all of us to this way of being together that really is the way we were meant to be, what we were made for. To create a little heaven wherever we go, find and create it in every relationship we stumble into, leave a trail of sweetness behind us. Imagine, Victoria Safford said in the part of the reading beyond what we already shared this morning, imagine something yearns in us to come round right. Something creaky, rusty, heavy, almost calcified within us tries, in spite of us and all our fears and self-deceptions, to turn and turn and creak and turn again and come round a little truer. Something in us stretches toward imagine. Imagine and blessings to all who live into the imagining. May we reign sweet love, harmony, restoration of the best of us down upon this hurting, waiting world. <laughs>